Today on Forbes, this startup is racing to be the first to mine helium on the moon. In the lobby of Interlune, a three-foot-wide tabletop diorama shows an idyllic, toy-sized version of the mining operation the Seattle startup wants to build on the moon. Boxy autonomous vehicles scrape up the top layer of lunar dirt and crush it to release gas containing a valuable form of helium. Solar panels on wheeled platforms generate power. Off to one side, a box resembling a military missile launcher is loaded with small rockets designed to carry bottles of the gas back to Earth. What Interlune is trying to do is far from child's play. Helium-3, an industrial-prized cousin of the isotope of the gas we use to fill party balloons, is rare on Earth. In 2024, it sold for $2,500 per liter, or roughly $19 million a kilogram, according to a report from Edelgas Group. Interlune CEO Rob Meyerson, who was the former president of Jeff Bezos' Blue Origin, expects an installation with just five of his mining machines could one day produce at least 10 kilograms of helium-3 a year, worth close to $200 million. However, the company faces daunting hurdles to get there. Though there is more helium-3 on the moon, it's still far from abundant. Even if Interlune can find lunar regions with higher concentrations, collecting a commercially viable amount of helium-3 means developing and transporting to the moon machines that can chew through millions of tons of regolith, the loose debris that covers the lunar surface from billions of years of micro-meteorite impacts, autonomously, with no boots on the ground to repair them as they kick up dust more abrasive than anything on Earth. Meyerson told Forbes, quote, that's one of the things we're going to be great at. Loud whooshes cut with a high-pitched whine from a compressor announce the presence of another thing the company needs to be great. It's ultra-low temperature distillation equipment. Interlune expects less than 1% of the gas they'll get when they crush lunar regolith will be helium-3. It's estimated to exist only in the single to double-digit parts per billion. To separate it from balloon helium and hydrogen, they're cooling it all beyond negative 450 degrees Fahrenheit, at which point the other gases will liquefy and the helium-3 can be siphoned off. Gary Lai, Interlune's chief technical officer and who once ran Blue Origin's New Shepard rocket program, said, quote, This is probably our hardest problem, but we're making a huge amount of progress. Even if Interlune is able to establish its first lunar mining camp, economic viability is still an open question, said Chris Dreyer, a professor of space resources at the Colorado School of Mines, given all the unknowns as to how expensive and reliable its equipment will be and how that intersects with the actual concentration of helium-3 in the regolith. Dreyer said, quote, I wouldn't be surprised if they don't make money on the first few times they do this, but over time, perhaps they can. A bevy of startups are developing ways to exploit water and minerals on the moon to make rocket propellant or build structures there, like Starpath and iSpace. Others want to mine valuable metals on asteroids, like Astroforge, to reduce the need to dig up the Earth. But despite its many challenges, Interlune may be among those with the best shot of building a business in the near term based on bringing resources back to our planet, partly because it has ways to monetize its technology in the meantime. So what kinds of terrestrial uses are there for its technology? Interlune is pitching companies that derive helium from natural gas to use its distillation equipment to separate the tiny amount of helium-3 also present. Meyerson thinks they could ramp to producing a kilogram a year, worth roughly $20 million. Another near-term business? Making space dirt on Earth. Interlune needs lots of simulated moon regolith implanted with gas to test its mining machines, and other companies and government agencies are eager to buy it to test their own space equipment. Interlune has won a $4.8 million grant from the Texas Space Commission to develop and mass-produce regolith simulant. For full coverage, check out Jeremy Bogaski's piece on Forbes.com. This is Kieran Meadows from Forbes. Thanks for tuning in.